So yeah. I, th I think we are ready to start. Okay, so everyone, thanks for joining us today. It's a great pleasure to introduce you to André Martins. He studied physics and computer science and works in one of the largest banks in South America since a while. He's a researcher there. And in addition to machine learning and data sciences, he is also specialized in quantum computing. And I'm very happy that he accepted my invitation to talk to us today. And he will not be talking to specific projects at the bank, of course, because that's very secretive and very strategic. But he will give us a taste about the world of quantum computing in the life sciences. It's a great opportunity you know, to know what is going on in this field. And I ask him to go especially slow because even for me, it's a new world. So he'll be giving this kind of introduction. And feel free to ask questions, you know, after the talk. You can also send me on the chat, you know, if you're a little bit shy to ask. Don't worry. And if you missed any of our previous presentations, or even this one, if you have to leave early, we just started our library, our channel on YouTube, where we'll have all presentations available. And with all this said, I will turn off my camera and leave the stage for Andre Martins to start. Andre, thank you very much. The stage is yours. Okay. So thank you very much, Tiago. First of all, I'd like to thank you all for the for coming here for this presentation. Thank you, Tiago, for the invitation. It's a big, big pleasure to be speaking to you guys here. Um, so today, as Tiago mentioned, we're talking a little bit about quantum computing. And since we're talking here for a research group of very talented people interested in the life sciences, I'll talk to you a little bit about some of the applications, some of the potential of this new technology to the life sciences specifically. But of course, since it's a, a quite of a little bit different subject here, I will first give you guys a, a gentle introduction to the field that will tell you a little bit about what is quantum computing on what, how is it different from conventional computing? And then we can go, we can follow for these very interesting applications. Right, so once again, thank you very much for the attention. Thank you very much for the invitation. And well, I think we can start. Oh, a, a very important point. Uh, so this presentation will be done in parts. And whenever I finish a part, I will ask if you have some questions. Of course, if you, if you are more comfortable with it, you can leave the, the questions from the, for the ending, but be absolutely comfortable to make questions whenever you want, okay? So, all right, let's start here, uh, our presentation about quantum computing. Uh, so, as I said, I will start with a brief introduction to, to the concept so that we can start moving for, for the applications. Uh, so, there's a very simple and pragmatic definition for quantum computing that I always like to use, that is the following. Quantum computing may be defined as the use of the properties of quantum mechanics for information processing, all right? And of course, it's a very simple definition, but it doesn't make any sense if I don't explain a little bit what is this quantum mechanics, right? And well, quantum mechanics is a physical theory when, which describes a very, very particular domain of nature, which is nature in the subatomic scale, okay? So we're talking here atoms, oops, I'm sorry, okay. So we're talking atoms, we're talking molecules and below, right? So uh, particles, subparticles and very small, very light things. And that's the domain that is described by quantum mechanics. And well, it's one of the most successful and one of the most experimentally, experimentally verified theories out there. We do lots of technologies with quantum mechanics and it's not merely a theory. It, it has become in the past century, a very important tool for us to describe the world in this very specific scale and also to assist development of one of the most important technologies that we have today. Uh, so starting with the semiconductor technology, which is the base for 
all of our current uh, classical computing and many other many other very important applications for us they arrive from quantum mechanics and despite this very this very prominent success it is indeed a very unintuitive theory for the simple fact that it describes a regime of the world which is simply too different from the macroscopic world in which our intuition was built. So given this, uh, we, may have, we may feel some sort of discomfort when we study the phenomena which are, which are described by quantum mechanics, but that's totally normal given that it describes a world very different from the one with which we have contact. And a very important aspect which makes this unintuitive um, behavior very clear is the fact that quantum mechanics is an inherently probabilistic theory. One of the few things that are indeed essentially fundamentally probabilistic. And this caused discomfort from one uh, to one of the greatest minds throughout history, like for instance, Albert Einstein. Uh, and it's not to, it's not something that we can do anything about. It's just how it is. It's how, as far as we know, nature really behaves probabilistic like this. Nature really behaves as described by quantum mechanics. But anyway, that's the theory which we use. That's the kind of physical behavior that we explore when talking about quantum computing as I would describe in the following. And actually, if we're talking quantum mechanics, uh, we should maybe change these pictures of atoms and molecules to this kind of stuff, right? So according to quantum mechanics, atoms, the electrons in the atoms, actually they are described not by these perfect orbits uh, of electrons around the nucleus, but rather by this orbital of probabilities uh, of where the position of the electron may be around the, the nucleus. And that's the kind of picture that we can have a better modern quantum mechanical vision for atoms and molecules. All right, so that's it. That's basically where we, how we can define quantum computing. But of course we could, we can go a little bit deeper, right? And we can ask ourselves, okay, what changes in, in the most fundamental level when we're comparing quantum computing with classical conventional computing. So everything starts with the introduction of the qubits, all right? And the qubits, it represents a change in the most fundamental, the most essential way of information processing, which is the level of the minimal, the minimum units of information. So everyone knows that the classical computing, classical information, may be given in the most fundamental level. Oops, I'm, I'm sorry, my camera went out. All right, <laughs> if you can see it now. All right, so in the most fundamental level, we can, we know that the minimal amount of information is stored in the so-called classical bit. And the bit can be kind of visualized like this switch, okay? We, we know that everything, the most fundamental level in classical computing may be given in terms of these binary variables, the bits, which are either zero or one and nothing else, okay? We do have these discrete binary information values and that's it. Everything that we can think of in classical information can be fundamentally uh, summarized, fundamentally described by these bits, these binary variables, which can be seen as these switches, given that they are indeed discrete, discrete. There really aren't other logical values for the classical, for the classical fundamental levels of information. Everything changes when we introduce the so-called quantum bit or qubit for short. Uh, the qubits can be seen as this kind of picture here, instead of a discrete switch between zero and one only. Here we have a possibility of a combination between these two discrete values, okay? We can have a little bit in zero, a little bit in one, uh, and this combination, of course, it must uh, be normalized to 100%. So we can have, for instance, 30% zero and 70% one, half, half, 50, 50, or any continuous combination between these two variables, between these two logical states. This is the quantum bit, okay? We can have zero, we can have one, but we can have also everything in between. With the introduction of the quantum bit, with this change in the most fundamental level of information, it, it, with this modification, we 
give birth to quantum information. And when we start processing this kind of quantum information, we have quantum computing. And of course, at this point, you may be wondering, okay, but how on earth can we have zero one and everything in between, right? How can we even codify physically this kind of, of construction? Or how can it be possible? And well, it's possible given some very particular, some very important quantum properties of these physical systems, which are described by quantum mechanics of this very tiny, small, light quantum system. And we will start by describing a very important property, which is quantum superposition. Okay, you may, maybe you may have heard about this quantum phenomena via the thought experiment of the Schrodinger's cat. The cat, which is both alive and both dead until we visualize, until we open the box, that's the kind of thing, uh, this thought experiment, which is described, which describes the quantum superposition, these important quantum phenomena, which we explore in quantum computing in order to yield some sort of computational advantage. And, but well, in order, it's all a little bit abstract. It's all a little bit, as I told you, unintuitive, right? So it's very important for, for us here to draw some analogies in order to better understand this kind of behavior, this kind of phenomena. So the analogy I'll draw here is the following. Uh, we can see classical bits as coins, okay? Coins which are on the table, either facing up or facing down, like heads or tails, uh, to which we can attribute here the, the classical logical values, the classical uh, fundamental units of information, okay? Either zero or one when the coin is on the table. That is an, our analogy here for the classical bits. But then we toss the coin, okay? We, we give it a flip, we make it to flip, and while it is flipping, we cannot even react like this. We can't really say if our, if, our, if our information state is definitely zero or definitely one. We just don't know. While it spins, the coin is in an indefinite state. Or even we could say in our analogy that it is in a superposition of being in zero and one. Many people, it's very common for us to see out there that superposition may be seen as the coin being at zero and one at the same time. That's not entirely the, the truth here. We, we don't say there's uh, they are in both states at the same time. It's more precise for it's a more precise way to describe situation, saying that it's in a superposition of states. It's in an indefinite state while it's rotating, okay? While we don't make the measurement it, that can be realized as the, the coin stops spinning and then resting on the table as either zero or one, okay? So of course, this is an analogy. Uh, there's the superposition has nothing to do with coins and nothing to do uh, with rotation explicitly, but it is a way for us to see, uh, to kind of visualize what superposition, uh, which is an inherently quantum phenomena, can be seen in, with, with here this, this coin-like analogy, all right? Uh, so yeah, that's it. That's the quantum superposition uh, property that quantum, quantum systems possess. But then you can ask, okay, that, that's cool and all, but so what? What can we do with it? What are the implications of this kind of phenomena for information processing, which is the theme of these call after all, right? Uh, and well, that's the so what part. So imagine that you have like five classical bits. So given that we have two possible values and only two possible values for each bit, we can represent with five bits, with five points, one of, one of the two to the fifth power or 32 possible permutations, possible combinations. So we have 32 possible binary strings uh, of length five, which we can represent one at a time with five classical bits. What changes when we change the classical bit for a quantum bit, for a bit which has this property of superposition, is that now we also have the same 32 possible combinations, but we do not have to represent each one of them separately, each one at a time. With the quantum bits, with superposition, we are we are able now to represent all of the 32 combinations of the 32 possibilities sim simultaneously. 
Okay, so we don't have to, so that's the kind of power that we gain with the quantum bit. We, we gain this sort of parallelism in which we can represent and process all the combinations, all the, all the two to the n, where n is the number of qubits, combinations at the same time. And that's very, very interesting. That gives an idea of why quantum computing is so interesting of the immediate impact that changing the classical bit for a quantum bit actually have in our representation and processing of information. All right, uh, but that's not all, okay? It's not only superposition that makes up quantum computing. We also have two other very important ingredients to very other very important properties of quantum mechanics which are explored uh, in the quantum computing area for us to have some sort of computational advantage. And those other properties are interference. Uh, and interference is, a, is, one of the, uh, is one quantum phenomenon that's really not that much an, an intuitive because interference is a sort of phenomenon which happens for other kinds of physical systems. And more specifically, it's a very, Common, it's a very characteristic phenomena characterizing wave or, or waves, oscillatory motion. Okay, so like this. Uh, what is interference? If we have like two waves, which are, uh, well, I think you can see my mouse here. So here in the left, if you have two waves, which are propagating in phase, as you can see, they propagate together. Uh, there's this phenomenon that when these two waves interact with each other, we have the so-called constructive interference. It's as if the amplitudes of the waves are summed up so that in, as a result of this interaction, we have a larger wave. We have a, a wave with a greater amplitude given that these two waves constructively interfere one with the other. However, if the, the waves are propagating with a phase difference in here, it's, it's the extreme case in which they are totally off phase, this induces the so-called phenomena called destructive interference, in which case the amplitudes are canceled uh, throughout the whole propagation, throughout the whole wave. And the resultant wave is like, you can see, not a wave anymore, okay? It's just uh, the wave is extinguished. And this, as I mentioned to you, it's a very common oscillatory phenomena. It's very common for waves of all different kinds, like uh, water waves and sound waves and all waves that we can think of. But very interestingly, and this is one of the first discoveries of the, uh, uh, one of the early quantum phenomena which were discovered in the, in the beginning of the 20th century, is that quantum systems, so atoms, molecules, particles, and below, they also behave as waves in the sense that they do present interference. So there's this very famous experiment called the double slit experiment, uh, experiment in which we shoot electrons, which, okay, we see as particles, we see as this quantum object, and these, uh, okay, we shoot these electrons in this kind of two slits, okay, there's a barrier here with two little openings, and then if we leave the system to, to evolve, we see that in the end, these electrons are detected in a so-called interference pattern, which is exactly what we observe for waves, okay? For other kinds of waves, which gave rise to this kind of duality between particle and waves for quantum objects. And the thing is that after a century of understanding quantum mechanics, we now see that, okay, the electrons, quantum objects, they're not waves, they're not particles, they are quantum objects. They are objects with which behave differently depending on the situation, but most importantly, they behave according to quantum mechanics. And quantum mechanics allow for these objects to present, to have the effect of interference. And that's a very important resource for us to use in quantum algorithms, in quantum computing, as I'll mention uh, in the following. Okay, so that's the second ingredient. And the third ingredient is quantum entanglement. So entanglement is a much more difficult phenomenon to explain because it's really a inherently quantum property, an inherently quantum behavior that has absolutely no, count, no classical counterpart, but it's basically like this. Um, when we have two quantum systems here, 
for two atoms and they interact in a very particular way, they become very strongly correlated in the sense that we cannot anymore describe the system as being made of two separate systems. But now, after they become entangled, we must describe the system as being a single system which with now many, many parts, but it, they behave now um, jointly, okay? We cannot describe the system separately anymore. And when this happens, uh, it gives us some really quite strong implications on, 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 and possibilities, even implications and possibilities in the, in the information processing realm. And of course, that's a resource that we use in quantum computing. So with these three ingredients, okay, superposition, interference, and entanglement, which again, uh, I, I know they are so quite an intuitive and quite abstract phenomena, because remember, they, are, they describe a regime of, of nature which we are not used to, okay, which is quite far from our intuition for our macroscopic world. But these phenomena, they do happen. They do exist and they are explicitly explored uh, in quantum computing for us to have uh, this different, this fundamentally different computational paradigm, okay? And with these resources explored, we can introduce the so-called quantum algorithms, okay? Which, well, now maybe will be the first time for some of you in which you will see a quantum algorithm and that's it. That's a possible representation for a quantum algorithm. Here uh, in, the, in the horizontal lines, we have our qubits, okay? We have our uh, minimal, our fundamental units of quantum information. This colored box here are the so-called quantum logical gates. They are transformations, very analogous to the classical logical gates that we apply to classical bits, which are basically this, they are transformations which induce a change in the quantum informational state. They change the, the state of information. So they are what we must do in order to effectively perform an algorithm. Okay, so algorithm, a quantum algorithm may be seen as a composition of these transformations which are composed in a very particular way so that we explore those three properties. We explore superposition, entanglement, and interference each one of these properties for uh, its own end with its own uh, goal. But the, the idea is to explore these properties throughout the algorithm by modifying the state of information of quantum information and possibly exploring those properties in a way that gives us some sort of advantage uh, comparing to the classical counterparts with, with compared with the classical um, procedures, classical algorithms that we can think of. And in the end, as we, after we process this information, exploring this phenomena, we, those black little box here, they are what we call measurements, okay? In the end of the quantum algorithm, we must perform a measurement. And it is with the measurements that we recover classical information that we recover the answer, the output of the algorithm. So that's how we can effectively make use of these very important properties of quantum mechanics to actually process information and have uh, hopefully better, but at least fundamentally different paradigm, fundamentally different way of doing computation. All right. So in summary, there's these very important points that I, will, I would like to stress here. After this uh, short, but hopefully comprehensive introduction to quantum computing, uh, I'd like to give, to stress three very important points. First, uh, quantum computing, it's not simply a faster processor, okay? Uh, it's not only, it's not simply by itself a way to make things run faster. Uh, it's not also a way to merely do some sort of crazy parallelization in a way that, okay, it's like some sort of different GPU in which we parallelize even more, even more, even more, and this gives us some faster uh, realization of our algorithms. This could be the case, okay? We could have faster algorithms with quantum computing, but not, that's not exactly the end goal every time. The end goal and the fact what quantum computing actually is, is that it is a fundamental new way of doing computation, of actually representing 
and processing information. It's new, it's different, it's fundamentally different from classical computing. Not necessarily faster, but different and hopefully better in some ways, okay? Not necessarily speed, but in some ways. And of course, that's for us quantum developers to figure out how can we make use of all these, these properties of this new com uh, fundamentally different quantum computing paradigm for having better algorithms, okay? But the point is, it is different, all right? Fundamentally different, which means that we do have to change everything we know and reframe our problems to fit into this new kind of computational paradigm. All right, uh, and well, uh, so that's our fast, but not so fast, but uh, brief introduction to quantum computing. And of course, now at this point, you may be having some, some questions, which I will address uh, in the following order. First, you may be, uh, you may be wondering, okay, uh, okay, that's cool and all, but can I implement this? Uh, is this a highly theoretical uh, possibility of doing quantum computing? Or can we even actually, actually compute, execute a quantum algorithm in an actual hardware? Can this be done? So I will tell you that yes. And I will show you a little bit more about quantum hardware, uh, which is the physical systems which implements all of these ideas. And okay, once we see the quantum hardware, you may be wondering, all right, so how can I program, pro program these machines? Okay, how can I code a quantum algorithm? So I'll show you some possibility into that. And afterwards, of course, applications. Okay, we can program it. We can run some algorithms on, on these quantum machines. But okay, what can we do after all? What are our possibilities into having some sort of useful thing for this kind of technology? And that's where I will talk you, to you a little bit about the, some of specifically here applications to quantum, to life sciences, biology, chemistry, and all of that, uh, uh, and that kind of very interesting stuff. All right, so that's the plan for now. And uh, as I told you, if you have any questions at some point, please do ask them, or if you prefer to leave to the end, that's perfectly okay as well. All right, so. Okay, so I'll just go on. Uh, anyway, uh, just repeating, be free to make questions at any time. So let's talk here now about quantum hardware, all right? So, okay, where can we run? Where can we actually implement all these promises and all these cool stuff, the qubits and everything that I've just told you about? So currently we are in a very early stage of quantum computing, all right? That, that's something I'd like to say from as of now, okay? So we don't have yet, those very scaled machines, uh, machines which uh, work very well. The machines that we have currently, the quantum computers that we have currently, they are very small, they are very noisy because we are indeed in the early stages of the technology. But we do have some quantum hardware which are already available for us to use to make some proof of concepts and stuff like that. And the thing is that we have different architectures, different proposals of physical system, which systems which implement the qubits, which implement all these ideas that I, I told you about. So a very famous implementation, a very famous physical platform for the qubits for quantum computing are the so-called superconducting qubits, uh, which are done for by, by companies like IBM, Google, Rigetti, uh, and these kinds of qubits are, they look like this. They are really microfabricated chips, similar to the ones that we have in our computers, but with the difference that they are not made with, with semiconductors, they are made with superconductors, which is uh, a very particular uh, form of, of metal, which allows for quantum phenomena for us to actually have all these, in those three properties and everything that we need to have a quantum system in implementing our quantum information. So that's one proposal. Another proposal that is very, very interesting is the so-called ion preps, which is a kind of hardware done by uh, companies like IonQ and Honeywell. And this picture here, I think it's really, really, really impressive. I think I, I'm always impressed about it. Uh, as you can see here, we have this chip and in the middle of the chip, we can see these little dots. And these dots are individual atoms, okay? actually individual ions, but individual atoms, which are individually trapped within lasers and electromagnetic fields, and they can be manipulated individually. They can be moved throughout space 
and really processed uh, in carrying the quantum information for us. So that's the kind of, of hardware, that's the kind of proposal that these companies here do. Another very interesting proposal are the photonic quantum computers. Okay, so this is like the, the quantum ship looks, uh, this is how it looks like. So it is basically an interferometer in which we make the photons here, our qubits are photons, so particles of light. And these photons, they interact in this kind of grid uh, where the processing happens in this chip. And in the end, we make the measurements. So the, the qubits themselves are photons, are particles of light. So all of these properties, and these are only three, proper, three pr proposals, I'm sorry, uh, three different architect architectures and only three. There are many others. People use uh, diamond cavities for quantum for qubits. People use the topological qubits. They use quantum dots. They use their really lots and lots of proposals. These are only three. Arguably the most interesting, the most, uh, the most promising architectures, but still we are so in the early stages that we don't know which will be the winning, maybe if there is some sort of winning architecture. But what we actually expect is that some of these will be more suitable for one or other kind of problem uh, as, the, as the technology evolves. But as, I, as I told you, we are still in the very early stages and we will see in the end, uh, here within some years, hopefully, which, which architecture will be better scaled, will be better suited for our actually impactful implementation of quantum computing. And of course, I could never talk about hardware and not mention quantum annealing, okay? Which is the kind of, uh, the kind of quantum computing machine done by, um, constructed by the Canadian company D-Wave, uh, which is, as you can see, separated from the other kind of proposals because quantum annealing is a very, very specific, uh, application, a very specific kind of quantum computing, which is thought for a very specific kind of problem, which is optimization, okay? And here we can talk about all sorts of optimization that you can think of. And here more specifically in our life sciences context, we can do some molecular optimization, some protein optimization, drug discovery, and very interesting stuff by using this kind of machine uh, done, constructed here by D-Wave. As I told you, it's not a universal, uh, a universal all purpose sort of machine. It is for a very specific application, but it's out there. And because it's very specific, it scales much better than the other proposals. And uh, which is to say that we can actually today do some quite interesting things quite interesting stuff with this kind of quantum annealers, as I will mention for you in the following slides. So, okay, that's some of sort of high level view on the hardware. And there's a lot of very nice possibilities for us to use these hardware and start having some impact. But as I told you, we're still in the so-called NISC era and NISC, it means noise intermediate scale quantum computing, which is in a, how, that's where we are, okay? We have here, quantum computers, which are small, intermediate, intermediate scale. They are very noisy, but okay, we can do some stuff with it. Uh, now to start exploring, to start doing some proofs of concepts, while we still don't get in the so-called fault tolerant regime, which will probably arrive in five, 10, or who knows uh, how many years, but that's when we will have the most impactful applications, which of course doesn't mean that we cannot do very interesting thing, things already now we can do, and that's where we are, and that's why we have to be prepared for when the hardware start scaling in the close future, we hope, right? And as I told you, some of these big players which are responsible for developing the hardware, they have these roadmaps of development, very detailed and very much outlined. This is the scaling uh, roadmap from IBM, and so as you can see, they expect that the qubits are evolving year by year, year after year. And by 2023, they expect for us to have over a thousand qubits, which is a very important landmark for us to have some sort of impactful applications. So here's another um, roadmap of development by the IONQ, which works with 
trapped ions, as I told you. And every major company, they do have these plans of scalability. And that's just to say that even though we are now in the early stages, we can hope for very nice, nice things to come in the close future in terms of scalability, which will bring us possibility of real actual impact. Okay, and so that's uh, all I had to say uh, about hardware. And now the second point is, okay, how can we program these machines? How can we actually code a quantum algorithm? And so here I'll briefly mention some of S some SDKs, some software development kits for those of you here, which are programmers who are interested in programming quantum algorithms. Uh, you can do it, okay? You can do it very easily. And the great news is you can do it in Python, all right? So the most, so I'll describe here some SDK, some essentially libraries, which can be used for, for doing for coding quantum computers. Uh, so uh, here we have Qiskit, which is definitely the most famous and the, the largest ecosystem for doing quantum computing uh, with Python. Uh, it's a library, it's all open source, but it's developed and maintained by IBM, IBM okay? We have these tools from Google, uh, the, the, the quantum computing framework is called CERC, but we also have some very specific applications like TensorFlow Quantum, which is used for quantum neural networks. Uh, we have these frameworks here, Penny Lane and Strawberry Fields, developed by the Canadian company Xenadu, which is the company that does uh, photonic ships, as I mentioned before. And they, these frameworks, these libraries are very, very interesting and very specific. In particular, Penny Lane, it's, it may be used for quantum machine learning and also differentiable chemistry, uh, quantum chemistry applications and some sort of really, really interesting stuff. So there's another option here. And of course we have Ocean, which is the SDK by D-Wave for us to program those kind of quantum anillers optimization problems into their machines. So all of these, they are actually libraries for Python, which is a very good new, right? Because uh, it's Python, okay? Of course, we have to learn how to use the SDK. It has its, its particularities in syntax and stuff, but it's Python, as I'll show you a little code fragment in the next slide, okay? So that's, that's nice. Uh, people know that everyone loves Python, so that's why they implement these using this very, very used language. But uh, not everything is done in Python. So here I would like to give you an example, Q Sharp, which is the uh, language, and it's really a different language. Q Sharp, it's based on C Sharp, which is Microsoft's uh, language. And okay, Q Sharp is maintained by Microsoft as a different separate language for doing quantum computing. And there are other initiatives like uh, stuff in Java and stuff in Swift. So other programming languages as well. But as you can see here, Python really leads the way as the platform in which people do quantum computing currently. All right, and for those of you programmers and everyone that's interested, how does the code look like? So maybe we, we may think that, okay, it will be something very low level, very really working with bits. And that's true in a sense, we, to, in order to develop a quantum algorithms, uh, algorithm, we must think in the level of qubits, in this very low level, but we do not have to program in this very low level. So here is an example for, for, from Qiskit. And how does the code look like? That's it. So here I'm, I'm just declaring, constructing a quantum circuit uh, with two qubits, which will have these quantum gates here, these uh, modifications, these, uh, these operations to modify the information states of the qubits. And here I can even draw the circuit as you can see. So it's really high level. As you can see, we work, uh, we think in the low level, but we work in Python in a quite high level. Okay, and here is how we can send our job, our circuit for execution. Okay, so basically I say, okay, now measure the qubits and now uh, change, choose this backend for our quantum execution. In the case here, it's a simulator and they execute and then plot me the results of the algorithm. Or, okay, the result of the measurement and that's the result. So it's very interesting as you can see, it's really, oops, sorry. Of course, uh, we, we must know what, uh, what are the resources uh, that are available for us. We must think in a quantum way, but we program in Python, in Jupyter Notebooks, in very familiar platforms, uh, familiar high-level platforms, and that's uh, very good news, right? That's really good news. 
So for those of you which are programmers and are interested in that, we can talk a little bit later on. But that's the thing that I, I'd like to tell you about SDKs, about programming quantum computers. And also a very important point is that we can access even today those machines. Okay, all those machines that I told you about, they are access. Uh, they are available for us to access throughout the cloud to remotely access them. So we have the service here from AWS, Amazon, which is called Amazon Bracket, which gives us access for several different machines. As you can see here, D-Wave, IonQ, Rigetti, and we can really literally connect to the clouds and per pay for our use, pay for shock, pay, pay for the job that we send for execution, and then wait for the results to come back. So it's a very nice way to actually have access to those machines without the necessity of actually buying them or constructing them, them ourselves, right? And not only Bracket, AWS has this service, but also we can access uh, IBM's quantum computers. They have a lot, a lot of systems available for us, and we can even just sign up to their uh, to their cloud services and send our jobs and, and access the machines as well. So that's really interesting, right? We, although we are in the early stages, we already can access and can experiment with all those machines. And uh, well, so finally, given all this introduction, uh, I'll talk a little bit now about some applications, specifically, as I mentioned to you guys, uh, in the life sciences. So just a quick comment. We do have a lot of possible different applications of quantum computing. Uh, from finance to machine learning to logistic optimization to uh, you think it you name it security cryptography lots and lots of possible applications uh, but quantum chemistry and simulation life sciences are expected to have a very early impact of quantum computing because that's actually the sort of application which motivated the introduction, the conception of quantum computing. And this is this was done by this fellow here, Richard Feynman, the American physicist, Nobel Prize winning, which is the father of quantum computing. There's a very famous quote from Richard Feynman in which he says, guys, nature is not classical, right? We know that nature, at least in this domain of microsp microscopic systems, it does behave according to quantum mechanics. So if you want to simulate this behavior, okay, and well, you know more than I do, uh, it's of, of a very, very big interest that we can simulate molecules, that we can simulate proteins, we can, uh, because that's the tool we have to develop drugs, to develop new materials, to develop uh, lots of things related to chemistry and the life sciences. So if you want to do this sort of simulations, we should not use our classical systems. We should rather do the simulations in a quantum system, okay? And as Richard Feynman said, by golly, it's a wonderful problem because it really doesn't look so easy. And indeed, it's not easy. Uh, so that's what all these companies have been doing in the hardware side in order to allow for a, a system which implements this. And we here in the software side are thinking about application software to actually do this kind of stuff. Uh, but that's uh, how quantum mechanics was born, you know, thinking about the so-called quantum simulation, about using a quantum system to simulate a qu another quantum system to simulate some sort of quantum behavior, which is chemistry, molecules, right, and biology, uh, ultimately. And this is the paper, oops, oh, sorry again. So this here is the paper uh, in 1982, in which Feynman proposed this idea more concretely. And well, this is considered the, the birth of quantum computing. Uh, so let's talk a little bit more about quantum simulation, right? What can be done um, as now, now in terms of conceptualizing, but in the very close, hopefully close future, actual impact, what can be done in quantum chemistry? What can be done in quantum simulation? So with quantum computing, we have some very formal tools for us to better define our chemical problems. So the, building the molecular Hamiltonians, which are the way that molecules interact and how atoms interact to make up a molecule. We can do the so-called differentiable Hartree-Fock method. Hartree-Fock is one of the most prominent methods for doing quantum chemistry. We can do this differently in quantum computing, which is a very good thing if we want to 
keep advancing our quantum simulation methods. And we can do some more pragmatic stuff like modeling chemical reactions, simulating quantum, uh, simulating chemical processes, uh, optimizing geometry of molecules, okay? We, which of course brings us to the idea of protein folding and all of that really, really interesting applications that we need to have for better drug designs for protein designs and all sort of stuff related to life sciences, right? So all of this is possible with quantum computing, okay? And all, all of these pictures, by the way, I took from this page here, Pain Lane, as I mentioned to you guys, is that framework developed by Xenadu, which is very good for doing quantum chemistry. And those here are tutorials. So for those of you who are interested in code, I really suggest for you guys to just look up in Google Penny Lane uh, quantum, quantum Chemistry, you will find these tutorials quite easily or just follow this link. And there you will find some tutorials, you will find some code about all of these very interesting applications in quantum chemistry, all right? So this is some sort of a high level explanation of what can be done, but I also brought here some more concrete examples. So I will, I will first talk to you about a problem which is in the life sciences, okay? It is in the biology realm. It's not exactly a health problem, but it's a very, very relevant problem, which is the FIMOCO problem. So this is related to the nitrogen fixation uh, context. So we know, uh, so this uh, FIMOCO here, FIMOCO is, it stands for iron, molybdenum and co of cofactor. It is a cofactor which binds to this protein here, multi protein, which is the nitrogenase protein. So the nitrogenase protein does something quite remarkable, which is to get the nitrogen gas, which is in the atmosphere, and convert it into ammonia, right? And plants do this, okay? So plants and some, some fungi, some algae, they do this. And it's very, very interesting how it is possible for them to do this conversion, to do this, uh, this process in, in normal, normal conditions of temperature and pressures, because they do this naturally, right? And we know it's identified that this, this nitrogenase protein, which is an enzyme, uh, actually rather a class of enzymes, which are responsible for this nitrogen fixation, uh, fixation. and within, the, the protein there in the core, in the active site, we have this FIMOCO, the, the actual cofactor, which is responsible for catalyzing the reaction and actually splitting the very stable, very hard triple bond of nitrogen in order for it to be transformed into ammonia. And as I mentioned, and I want to stress this, plants do this, so this protein do this in at room temperature and at standard pressure. And that's very, very intriguing. And although we now have a, an idea of the proteins involved in the process, we don't know yet how. We don't fully understand the mechanism behind FIMOCO and rather the, the full whole nitrogenase protein, which allows for this process. And okay, you can say, all right, but what's the deal about this? The deal is the following. This is a very, very, very important process because we need, as a society, we need ammonia for doing agriculture, agriculture basically, to make food, right? Uh, so this is a, a very interesting process, which is called the Haber-Bosch process, which is kind of the basic process, in the industrial process that we use today in order to make ammonia. So it's, of, of course, a very complicated process, but as you can see here, it gets as input air, in which we have nitrogen, and here water and methane and some other substrates. And basically in the process, we use lots, a lots of energy to make the pressure and temperature quite high for us in order to, in the end, have this final product, ammonia. And as I told you, it's a very, very important product for us as a society, for agriculture, for some really, really important applications. But as you can, as I told you, this is an industrial process which requires a lot of energy, a lot of effort, and it's not very much efficient. In the, meanwhile, plants do this. Plants do this without the necessity of high temperature, without the necessity of high pressure. They do it. So the big question is how? How can we, what can we learn 
from the FEMO code. Well, what can we learn from the, nitro, uh, the nitrogenase in order to actually replicate this process and have a better industrial process to produce, to produce ammonia or a better process for nitrogen fixation? How can we do it? And the, the, the big question is that we don't know. Okay, we still don't know. If we could better understand the function of this huge protein, okay, of this huge enzyme, and more specifically, what FEMO code does there, what's the role of this cofactor and how, what's the exact mechanism of working, we could maybe have a better way of doing this process and really designing even a new, more efficient and way less energy dependent process, right? That, that's the hope. And indeed, that's what this paper here and brings us a possibility of a near term application of quantum computing, okay? And so here I'll not delve into the details of what could be done, but I would just here with this slide wanted to emphasize what is the kind of, of procedure that we think that will be useful in the, first, in the near term future by exploring quantum computing. We have lots of pre and post processing, which are classical, which are doing here in our conventional computers, right? Uh, and the difficult part, which is computing the bond energies by actually simulating the geometry and actually what really takes a lot of computational efforts, which we are not able to do today with classical computers, this will leave to the quantum computer, okay? It is a part of the full pipeline that will allow us, allow us to actually solve this problem here in the FIMOCO, uh, FIMOCO and any other uh, problem that you can think about in quantum computing and in the life sciences. So it's very interesting. And I'd like to stress in this slide that another thing that must be very clear, quantum computer, quantum computing will not replace classical computer. Rather, it will be alongside classical computer. They will work together to actually give us, deliver us, uh, deliver us some of the greatest applications that we can think about. All right. So that's one application. And of course, uh, there's another one that I would like to bring here, which is protein design. So there's this company, Canadian company, Maintain AI, which has recently done some really, really interesting work in protein design. So here uh, I'd like to point out for this paper here, design peptides on a quantum computer. So that's uh, uh, not a protein, a full protein, but a peptide uh, with 32 residues, which was optimized by Maintain AI, by this technique, which is not purely quantum, it's a hybrid technique, part classical, part quantum, but basically it works like this. They give as input the protein, the peptide backbone, and then all the, the degrees of freedom for the atoms, for everything else, and then it, it's optimized. Okay, this structure is optimized. And as an answer, we have the final protein structure. And this is done, by the way, in that machine that I told you guys is very specialized, the machine by, by D-Wave, the quantum annealer. And that's the sort of stuff that we can actually explore today in order to solve an important problem like protein design. And actually, uh, these same company, they use these kinds of techniques to present a, a possible protein uh, with an inhibitor to, to bind in the coronavirus glycoproteins in order to inhibit it, right? So it's very interesting. It's a work very, very relevant, very recent, right? So in the middle of the pandemics, they did a proposal of, of applying all these hybrid techniques in order to actually have better proteins, better target proteins. So as I told you, it's not purely quantum and we're not quite there yet. Right, but we can start exploring these possibilities and actually have some interesting, in fact, some interesting early stages deliverables, but interesting delivers deliverables nonetheless. Okay, so that's the kind of stuff. Okay, that's the kind of application that we have in mind. And think of the possibilities, guys. Uh, if we have access for better in silico simulations, we could really revolutionize the way we plan for for therapies for drugs and everything that could really revolutionize the way that we do life sciences inside quantum the quantum computer, all right? So that's it. Uh, here, I just would like to 
really fast mention some initiatives in industry related to quantum computing. So here you can see very important and big companies like AstraZeneca. Here, the, the, uh, a group of big pharmas which are involved in this so-called Q Pharma Alliance for employing quantum computing, which is led here by Bayer. And Roche also has reportedly uh, working on quantum computing. And that's only to say that Okay, it's out there. Uh, although we are in the early stages, there are some very, very uh, large companies interested in, in quantum computing, given all of its potential to dramatically change the way that we do, in this case here, right, that we do drug design and to actually impact the life sciences. Uh, okay, just to finish them tell you about a little bit about the roadmap to applications. We are in the early stages, okay? We still cannot have all these impacts, but we expect for this impact to come and to come fast. So here are, again, some a roadmap for impact from IBM. So as you can see here, drug design is one of the early stages expected applications by 2023, in which we will reach the thousand qubits barrier <laughs> landmark we will be able to have some quite impactful impacts as expected by IBM. Here, another roadmap of applications by IonQ. You can see that really materials chemistry expected to come in the not so long-term um, uh, scenario, right? So we're close, we're close. And what we can do right now is to get prepared, is to wait for the hardware to scale, but of course, live, uh, start planning and doing hardware, doing software, doing solutions for when the hardware is ready, we will be able to actually uh, have this impact um, implemented, all right? And just to, to finish here, I, I always like to show this picture, which is now very current in 2022. This is the amount of money which is invested worldwide wide in the quantum ecosystem, right? So you can see, we are in the early stages, but it already moves a billionaire, multi-billionaire um, economy throughout the world, right? And here is specifically Japan. It appears in the map by investing here over seven, $700 million in, in quantum technology. And that's really, really nice, right? Unfortunately here, Brazil still does not appear in the map, but we plan to have this painted in the, in the future, hopefully. But that's it, right? So quantum is a thing and it is a big thing already today. Imagine in five or 10 years in which all of this will give them us even more impact, right? So we must get ready, okay? And just to really end here, some take home messages. So quantum computing, it is a very promising emerging technology, which is yes, in its early years, but it's very, very promising. We must get ready. Chemistry and the life sciences, as I told you, as I show you, as I showed you, is one of the those applications which are expected to be deeply impacted by quantum computing and in the shorter term, hopefully, right? And, but, okay, that's all. If we, we want actual deep impact, we will have to wait some years yet, uh, possibly, right? But we cannot wait for the hardware to come, right? Sim simply wait. No, there's a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of software solutions there's a lot of really developments which are not only hardware, right? We must get ready and that's what we're doing. Uh, doing proof of concepts, experimenting with the hardware that we have currently available and then preparing ourselves for the quantum future which is really knocking on our doors, right? So that's it people. Once again, thank you so much for your time, for your attention. Uh, and of course now I'm totally open for questions if you have. Thank you so much. All right. Very good. Very good, Andrea. Thank you very much. This is fascinating, you know, this kind of technology. It's great to hear about it. So let me ask the colleagues in the audience, does anybody have any questions for Andrea? You can either ask or send me in the chat box directly, okay? Okay, so in this case, I'll start. I'm very curious about these things. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking about the different architectures, you know, the photonics and the D-wave 
and mm. the ones by Google and IBM. Mm. So I'm wondering, you know, so this is like the processor. Does it have any kind of memory, you know, to store the computations that were done so far and use them for another round of computations? Fantastic. Great, great question. So no, unfortunately, no. Uh, so there is this, this great challenge and it's actually an ultimate goal for us to build the so-called QRAM, right? Uh, a rapid access memory, which is quantum. And uh, it's very important for us to have it in order to do exactly what you said, right? We have this, this memory so that we can uh, faster, if, iterate faster in our experiments and transfer data and all stuff like that which we still don't have. And there are some theoretical proposals for QRAM, but it's safe to say that we're even, not even theoretically, we're quite there yet, right? So uh, that's a big challenge. And we, we hope that it will be possible for us to have it someday, but not yet, right? But it's a very important goal and people are working really hard in, into this direction, right? And that's uh, talking about QRAM, right? Uh, so. Uh, a RAM kind of memory. So thinking about loading information and then read the information and all that kind of stuff. Now, uh, when it comes to hard drives, okay, so persistent memory, we, we, I haven't heard of a proposal in this direction, but what I would say is that, okay, if you want to save our results, we save our results as classical information after the measurement, all right? And there are very, very important subtleties uh, regarding measurements and regarding the answer of these algorithms. But that's what I, I would say regarding to persistent memory, okay? But, but yeah, that's a very good question. And people are thinking about it, but we're not quite there yet. <laughs> I see, I see. Yeah, I was wondering because even if we had a little bit of memory, this could make a big difference. You know, I'm thinking about the early processors. Even mm -hmm. for the for the video games, you know, the 8-bit and 16-bits and so on, they had a small memory, you know, nearby, which could kind of recycle the information and feed them again. So, and this made a big difference in the, the yeah. picture. <laughs> so an, another, another question here that I received here to ask you is, among these architectures, you know, you mentioned that there are many architectures, some are explored mm -hmm. by some big companies and so on. Your personal take on which one is the most promising? Oh, okay. <laughs> so yeah, I, I was a little bit biased when I did this slide here because those are the ones I think are more promising. Okay, so uh, specifically in my personal opinion, and I'm far from being a hardware specialist, okay, but in my in my knowledge here, in my opinion, I really believe in photonic chips for a very good reason. Um, these, uh, as I mentioned, are the the kind the so-called QP, QP, oh, oops, sorry, QPUs, right? The quantum processing units, the, the actual core of processing. But here in the cover, I have a picture of the whole system. So this here is a quantum computer in all its glory, which is basically a very, very powerful fridge, right? It's actually a cryostat, which, is, which plays the role of making the system isolated, highly, highly isolated and cool down, okay? For it to be really, uh, for, it, for it to be possible to really control this system. And this is important because think about it. We're, we're talking about individual atoms, okay? We're talking about individual photons. We're talking about very small, very fragile systems, which we must control in order to process information. So if it interacts with the environment, if it is very much agitated with heat, it's all lost, okay? We lost all, all the, the properties that we want to have to process information. So in most of these architectures, okay, in specifically in the ones that I mentioned here, uh, superconducting and ion traps, we must have these very isolated systems, very cool systems in order to do quantum computation. In photonic ships, we do not have this necessity because we're talking about photons, right? And photons, they, first of all, they do not interact with themselves. 
they um, well being bosons they have some very nice properties which gives us some very high hopes that these kind of machines will scale better okay and we do not have the need of putting these into these huge cryostates no we can just have the systems and the photons flowing and being doing their jobs and the only parts that we do need to have a little bit cold is the measurement part, which is really a small part of the full hardware pipeline. So that's the one in which I really believe will we'll have a great impact, especially in terms of scalability, right? But as I told you, those three here, which are, which are explicit here, uh, I really believe in them. Each one has its pros and its cons. I would love to talk a little bit more about hardware. So if you want, uh, if there is some, some demand, I could, I could come back and talk a little bit in detail about the hardware, but that's it, okay? All of them are really promising, but I really like the fact that we do not have to wait to use that much energy in order to cool the photonic chips. So I really put some bets on them, all right? I see, very nice. Uh, okay, so I have two questions. You're all asking in order. Okay. The other question is, it seems from the program that you showed the code that it's kind of hybrid, like a little bit runs locally. And then some part, like the heavy part, runs in the quantum cloud. Is that correct? Yeah, uh, correct. But here, specifically in this code, as you can see, when I get the backend, so maybe I should take this to full screen. Okay, uh, yes. So here, uh, this is the part in which here, so in the left is the part in which I define the circuit, all right? And it's totally, um, it's totally on my own computer. It's on Python, it's totally local, all right? I define the circuit. And of course, this is a very simple circuit. Often we have some more complicated circuits with more stuff, with data being passed on and all that kind of stuff, but that's it. That, that's where we define what will be executed. And here on the right, we have the actual execution. And it was very, very well noted that here is where I define my back end. Okay, where will my software, my, my quantum circuit, my quantum algorithm, where will it be executed? And as you can see here, I'm getting a simulator, all right, quasim simulator. And that's what we do a lot. We, we do not always send our jobs for actual hardware execution because one, it's expensive, all right? So we have some, some options to use them by free, but then there's a huge queue. There are lots of people using it. The systems are not that, that good. So if we want some high quality hardware, we must pay for it. And, uh, and, and as I told you, they are very noisy, they are small. So we try to avoid as much as possible using directly the hardware. We do everything in terms of conceiving the algorithm with simulators. And what is an, a simulator? It's basically our classical computer, an absolutely normal computer, which simulates what the hardware does, okay? The problem is we can only simulate uh, circuits which are not that large, okay? We cannot simulate like anything above 100 qubits. It's totally impossible to simulate, all right? And, and even uh, in, my, in our current uh, common computers, like a laptop computer, it can simulate like at most 30 qubits and it's already quite difficult to get there. So there's this, this, this minor thing, but yes, okay, so simulators are very, very important. So going back to the question, here is where I choose, okay? Here's where I choose whether I want to simulate or where, whether I want to actually send it to the cloud. If I want to send it to the cloud, it's very simple. This is, as I, as I mentioned, right? A, a code from Qiskit, which is the IBM framework. So IBM has not only the framework for developing the code, but everything in order to integrate with the hardware and, and stuff. So if I wanted to send this job for their quantum computer, I would just here select the quantum computer that I want and give my credentials, right? My login, my API key, and we will go for the cloud. And then after some time, I get my results back. So totally, nice. in, totally in Python, right? Jupyter Notebook only. So that's how it works. Yeah. Okay, very nice. Another question. It seems someone understands here about the subject. Uh, could you comment about 
error correction code is 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 it the same algorithm for all architectures? So what, oh. what like what what is error correction? Okay, great question. So yeah, uh, when I showed this picture here, I told you that we're currently here, right, in the NISC era, in which we have these small noisy um, hardware devices, uh, and then we expect to get in the future in this so-called error correction threshold, in which we will have the so-called fault tolerance quantum computing. So let me elaborate a little bit on this. Um, every computer is uh, is success successful to errors, right? So for instance, our classical computers, there are errors. There are a lot of errors, especially in the early stages, there were lots of errors happened. But then with time, we developed the so-called uh, so error correction techniques, which are, some of them are based on redundancies. Okay, so we do the same calculation a lot, lots of times uh, repeatedly so that then we have uh, some sort of way to make sure what we have. So anyway, there are different, implementations of error correction for classical computing, which were of extreme importance for us to get from the, those early stages machines to what we have today, right? Today, we don't even have to bother about error correction. It's already taken for granted, right? But it is a very, very important question. And in quantum computing, it's even worse because what, what, what we call, uh, what is an error in quantum computing is basically, uh, when we try to apply those, those gates I told you about, those transformations, we really have to interact with the system, interact with the qubit. And as I told you, those qubits, they are very small, very fragile systems. And when we interact with them, first of all, we don't want to interact with them, uh, with the environment, because if we do so, we lose our quantum properties. But at the same time, we must interact with them in order to actually implement the algorithm. So it's kind of really a, a difficult situation here, right? We must interact, but we cannot disturb it too much. And this is what make, makes errors, right? This kind of way that we interact and actually we not, it's not possible to 100% isolate the systems. So the, the qubit does interact with its environment. So all of these are sources of errors, okay? And so now replying to the question, uh, what is error correction? Error correction is this, this very large necessity for us to have a way of correcting those errors, right? And there are lots and lots, it's, it's a field by itself, right? There are lots of proposals into how can we do error correction? Uh, how can we avoid, mitigate those systematic errors? And how can we actually encode information in a way that it's robust for, for it's robust to these kinds of errors. So uh, what can I say now? There's still not an, an ultimate definitive quantum error correction scheme, right? There are some proposals and there is, this is a very, very important topic, which is an active field of research. And also what was questioned, does it depend on the hardware architecture? And yes, definitely it does. So when we have a superconducting qubit, it has its own kinds of errors, given that we have all these qubits in a wire, in a, in a, in a, super, in a microfabricated ship, right? So it's more difficult to isolate this kind of system. It, it's complicated. And while when we have ion traps, we have these ions which are in a high vacuum. And so the source of errors are different. So yeah, it's, it's very dependent on the hardware. And it's another thing that we're not quite there yet. There's not an ultimate platform for error correction, but we are very actively researching on this field, given its major importance. One day we expect to get there in the fault tolerant regime, which is in the regime in which we have error correction and we can be tolerant to errors, all right? But it's still down in the future. Great question. Awesome. Great question. I see. <laughs> well, I think that was a great talk. I think then I'll ask again to the folks from the audience, if you have a last question for Andre, please ask um, now. May I? Oh, yes, please. Thank you. Um, I'm Miha Kato. Thank you very much for a beautiful presentation. Um, I'm a pediatric hemato-oncologist and belongs to the Childhood Cancer Research Center here in Tokyo. Um, thank you very much for introducing us a sophisticated way to process um, information. And that was 
totally new to me, but I can see it's coming. I have one question. Would the date volume itself be reduced by expressing multiple information by qubit, not classical bits? I mean, the types of the date that can be represented will explode, I think. But what about the capacity of the date to be managed at hand to store? Yeah, uh, so it, if I understood the question correctly, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this really talks, it really touches the Thiago's question about the, the quantum memory, right? So uh, if we, we, we want to solve like all, all of these problems, applications that I, I talked to you about, like uh, solving uh, a molecule, solving an optimization of structure, and, uh, and every application that we can think about, they really depend on loading this data to the quantum computer, right? And there are some very different ways of doing this loading, this data loading procedure. And when we're talking about quantum machine learning, which is also my, my field of research, it, there's, it's a very important question there. How do we load this information? And there are different proposals to do so. Some of them are more specific for the kind of thing that we want to do afterwards with, with this information, but that's a necessary step, right? We must get our classical information and map it, load it to the quantum system for it to be processed uh, in the qubits. So uh, there are many proposals. There are some concerns about the size of the data that we can load. There are some very different major concerns about how we do it, how we do it properly. But yeah, it's a very important point. And still, while we don't have our uh, a quantum memory, it will persist being a very important matter, right? Uh, and I'm sorry, I'm not entirely sure if that was a, your question. I had so, so noise. Uh, was it? If not, please do repeat. I can answer sure. more properly. Um, uh, I just wanted to know how, how, to, um, how to prepare for it because uh, the types of the date that can be represented will explode by um, expressing multiple information by qubit, not by um, classical bits. So um, I wanted to know the, um, the capacity of the date itself to be managed at hand will explode as well, or just small amount of up? <laughs> yeah, I see, I see. So yeah, uh, in terms of, of preparing for that, uh, so there has been some, so some proposals into dealing with big data and quantum computers. And this, those proposals were, were very uh, important, but currently we, we think that at least in the foreseeable future, right? So 10 to 15 years from now, we, we don't see how we could even like load those, when you talk about big data, we talk really big data, terabytes of information into our quantum systems because we still don't have this quantum memory, right? So of course it's an end goal. We want to get there, but it's still not something that we know how to do. There are some really early stages proposals for that. But anyway, when we're talking about infrastructure, it's very important to, for us to get prepared for it, right? To, okay, uh, try to construct an infrastructure which will be, which will make possible for us to communicate with these quantum services, to send our jobs, and to deal with all these, the inputs and outputs of the quantum computer. So as I told you, uh, we will not replace classical computers. Classical computers will be everywhere in the pre-processing, in the post-processing. It will really be around quantum computing all the time to actually manage all, all the rest, right? We will use quantum computers for these very specific points of the pipeline, which are difficult, which cannot be done directly in a, in a classical computer. So there, we think about these hybrid pipelines and there are some companies which are already offering some services in order for, uh, for us to get prepared for these infrastructural changes which will be needed when we will have the, the hardware available directly for us, right? But and one last comment, what I think and most people think that will be the, the kind of format will be this, right? It's not very, we don't really think that a company, uh, a, a research institute will buy a quantum computer for itself, you know, and we'll just have it dedicated. 
uh, because it's very, very, very expensive. It's, it's difficult to control. It's difficult to isolate as I mentioned. So what we think will happen is this. We will have some data centers throughout the world in which we will have the hardware there and we'll only access it via the cloud and then get our answer and then integrate everything to our pipeline. So, so yeah, and there's a lot of preparing to do in order to get there, right? <laughs> so. Thank you very much. Thank you, no, thank you. Very good question. Indeed, Kato Sensei's question is very relevant. I've been, since the processing power will increase, what we're gonna do with the information before and after yeah. all this processing. <laughs> Definitely. All right. So I think we are a little bit over time. So with all these explanations and this sharing of knowledge, I want to thank you, Andre, once more for sharing your knowledge. And thanks for the great presentation. Oh. So I think, think that's all. Okay. So it's just final words. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Thiago, for the invitation. It was a big pleasure to talk to you. And you can reach me in, on LinkedIn or uh, you can ask for Tiago, <laughs> to Tiago for my contact if you want to expand this conversation. And I really make myself available if you would like to know a little bit more about this and maybe know a little bit more about the coding part or the hardware part. So I'm totally available for future talks. And thank you very much again for the invitation. It was a big pleasure. See you. All right. Thank you. Andre, thank you very much. Have a great day ahead. Thank you for your two. Good night. Bye-bye. Right. Bye. Bye.